So today we're going to tackle a slightly more controversial study that basically discusses an attempt to describe cosmology using a hypothesis that's been long proven to be incorrect. The so-called tired light hypothesis originally proposed for the redshift observations by the famous Fritz Zwicky back in the 1920s. But after decades of research, this hypothesis has been mostly disproven. And disproven with titles like this. Tired light hypothesis gets retired. Back in 2001, when this was published, this kind of made me chuckle. But the thing is, something was actually discovered in this particular study, at least the way it looks right now, and so this something definitely has to be addressed at some point. And so, hello in full person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss this study by a computer scientist from Kansas State University that potentially discovers unusual observational evidence for something weird going on with the redshift. But before we discuss this study, I wanted to mention two things that usually make me worry about these propositions. So first of all, there's really no shortage of studies trying to claim some kind of a new discovery, or trying to rewrite modern cosmology. But in most cases, it's usually based on some kind of a miscalculation when it comes to reading data. Which is why, in these cases, it's usually best to look for studies with either multiple authors, or studies that are basically following up on someone else's discovery, trying to reanalyze the data, or possibly confirm someone else's observations. But in this case, this is a single author. And so here, we cannot come to any conclusions yet, and pretty much everything in this study has to be taken with a grain of salt. And so get your grains of salt ready, and let's talk about the overall ideas and what's discovered. So first, let's start with the basics. So based on many years of observations, we know that the farther the galaxy is, the more redshifted it appears. And for many decades, this has obviously been interpreted as galaxies moving faster and faster away from us the farther they are. And this is of course one of the main points of evidence for the Big Bang Theory. But there was also that proposition by Zwicky that maybe the universe was actually not expanding, but instead the light was somehow just getting tired from traveling for a very long time. And this idea was referred to as Tired Light, or TL for short. But it just could not explain a lot of things. For example, it could not explain why we don't really see as many galaxies far away from us as expected from the universe that's not expanding. Because in reality, at the distant universe we actually only see some galaxies, not as many as predicted. And there are quite a lot of things tired light hypothesis just cannot explain at all. For example, blurring. In that tired light hypothesis, distant galaxies are also supposed to be more blurry, but they're not. And there are quite a lot of ideas in regards to time dilation and even gravitational lensing that's also difficult to explain using this hypothesis. Which is why it was retired decades and decades ago. But scientists also agree that modern cosmological models are also not complete. For example, things like Hubble tension cannot be explained even today, and we do have quite a lot of other inconsistencies such as the SA tension we've discussed previously in one of the videos in the description that's also just a little bit difficult to explain. But here we have to remember that a lot of these ideas and a lot of these propositions are always based on the measurements of redshift, or essentially by using various distance indicators, which in this paper the author essentially proposes might be actually kind of incorrect. And that's really why he became kind of intrigued by this, just because his evidence does actually point at something. Now, when it comes to explaining some of these tensions and some of these inconsistencies, there are once again plenty of models. But what if instead of making new cosmological models and basically trying to explain everything by adding even more complexity, we actually approach this a little bit differently? All of these tensions and all of these issues are actually because our redshift model is not entirely correct. Or basically the measurements of redshifts of various galaxies is actually affected by something else that we're not considering. But before we talk about what this could be, let's actually discuss how this was achieved and what was calculated. And here the researcher focused on spinning galaxies, which is of course most of the galaxies. Which by itself is also a bit mysterious as well. Even today rotations of galaxies are actually kind of difficult to explain. There are obviously models like MOND and dark matter models that try to explain this, but even there, there are quite a lot of inconsistencies. Either way, we know galaxies spin, and usually from planet Earth, it appears as they rotate either in one direction or the other. Likewise, planet Earth also rotates around the galaxy as it orbits around the center. And although these rotational velocities are actually quite minor when it comes to redshift calculations, and these velocities have been previously basically ignored, 
the main assumption and sort of the main point in this paper is that maybe they shouldn't be ignored. Maybe these rotational velocities, and of course the motion of Earth around Milky Way, is also something we need to consider when calculating redshift. But how do you calculate all of this, and what possible data can we use to try to assess this? Well, interestingly, there are quite a lot of different surveys, and even citizen science projects, like the Galaxy Zoo, that have already assessed rotations of galaxies in the vicinity of the Milky Way, and determined specific redshifts to all of them. Here we actually have hundreds of thousands of different targets to choose from, and for all of them, we know which way they spin, and we know their redshift. And so the main purpose of this study was to examine galactic rotation and its effects on the redshift of thousands of different galaxies. And this was done by observing galaxies located around the galactic pole. And so by comparing redshift of galaxies rotating in the same direction relative to the Milky Way compared to galaxies spinning in the opposite direction relative to the Milky Way, here it became possible to determine if galactic rotations affected the redshift calculations with any significance. Now previously it was assumed that the farther the galaxy is and the higher its redshift, the smaller effect rotational velocity should have. And moreover, this rotational velocity was usually ignored for the majority of galaxies out there. But this paper took a different approach. So first of all, the rotation of the galaxy was determined by looking at galactic arms. Because basically by looking at these arms, you can kind of tell which way the galaxy is spinning. And then by using tens of thousands of galaxies and measuring their redshift based on the way they spin, the overall conclusion was that there was actually just a little bit of difference in terms of redshift when galaxies were spinning similar to the Milky Way as opposed to in the opposite direction. And so here there was a very small but potentially significant redshift bias when it came to galaxies rotating in a different way. And though this was obviously a relatively small value, it seemed to contribute approximately 1% of error to the measured redshift, which is significant enough for super accurate calculations such as when talking about Hubble tension. But more importantly, this bias surprisingly increased with distance or with redshift. So basically the farther away you were, the more this bias grew. And so even though it was like 1% at closer distances, it seemed to be closer to 3% for some of the farthest galaxies. And that's of course really bizarre and somewhat difficult to explain. And so one of the main conclusions in this study is of course this unexpected bias when it comes to galaxies rotating in the same way as the Milky Way compared to the ones spinning in the opposite direction. But the question is, why does it grow with distance? Well here, one of the potential explanations is of course that tired light hypothesis. Although here the contribution from that hypothesis would be quite minuscule. On the other hand, it may also suggest that maybe rotations of galaxies, and specifically the velocity of rotation, changed over time for some unknown reasons. Which would of course also contribute to errors in measurements, suggesting that redshifts would have to be recalculated for a lot of different galaxies. And so the idea that the redshift changes with distance, but not necessarily the velocity of the galaxy, potentially presents first evidence for Fritz Zwicky's tired light hypothesis. Because it would be very difficult to explain why this redshift bias goes up with the distance. And so the overall results show that galaxies that rotate in the opposite direction relative to the Milky Way generally have lower redshift compared to galaxies that rotate in the same direction. And though this could imply that a lot of these galaxies are just closer to us, it just doesn't really make sense why the spin of the galaxy would determine the distance to the Milky Way. And one of the more intriguing points made in the paper is actually in regards to the Hubble tension. Hubble tension is actually determined by the redshift, and turns out that this redshift bias does actually present us with very intriguing results if we use different types of galaxies. For example, if we just use galaxies that rotate in the same way as the Milky Way, the Hubble constant drops by about 4% and is actually consistent with a lot of different models, removing the tension completely. But if we use galaxies that rotate in the opposite direction, this value goes up, increasing the tension even more. And so here there's maybe something to consider for future studies. But despite this being a somewhat intriguing paper, I still have my reservations and there's obviously quite a lot of criticisms to be made, especially when it comes to data analysis or things to possibly consider before we can come to any conclusion. So first of all, this is once again a single author study and it just so happens that some of the biggest propositions in it, like this one right here that reveals that galactic spin seems to have a lot of asymmetry even in James Webb observations, or specifically proposing that quite a lot of galaxies seem to actually rotate in the opposite direction from the Milky Way for some unknown reason, 
Despite being somewhat intriguing, are all basically the same author referencing himself. And as far as I know, this has never been really double checked by anyone, so we don't really know how accurate any of this is. In other words, one of my biggest reservations right now is that this is a single author paper where he kind of references himself, and that by itself is not a really good scientific technique. At the same time, there are maybe too many assumptions about how galaxies are distributed. Here the assumption is that they're all randomly distributed, and thus detecting any kind of a redshift bias suggests our redshift calculations are maybe incorrect. But in reality, none of the galaxies are randomly distributed, and they're usually either in clusters or somewhere along the mysterious cosmic web placed in a very specific way along the filament. And because of this, by observing galaxies in a certain direction actually does create certain bias. And previous studies have actually confirmed that inside of this filament, the rotation of galaxies is kind of predetermined. In other words, the cosmic filament has a lot of power in guiding the galaxies and also in making them spin and move in a very certain way. Which by itself could already maybe address some of these assumptions. And so if by accident some of the galaxies chosen in the study were in certain locations in the filament, this could definitely explain everything. All of the bias, all of the unusual redshift differences, and of course the much higher number of galaxies rotating in a certain way. And the way to resolve this, and the way to see if this is actually correct, is by of course observing even more galaxies, and here we're not just talking about thousands, we would have to probably look at millions, in order to see if this redshift anomaly still stands. And if by looking at millions of galaxies we still discover the same, well then maybe there is something going on. But right now, based on just a few thousand galaxies, this could just be an extremely skewed data that possibly does discover some kind of an anomaly, but not really anything to do with tired light or possibly even rotations of galaxies. But I would still love to see some kind of a follow-up to this by basically someone who's really good at this and who can essentially conduct better observations and present their own conclusion and their own interpretation. Anyway, on that note, still a kind of an intriguing and somewhat unusual discovery and something we'll definitely come back and talk about once we have something somewhere. And so until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.